Okay, so in uh, we're going to do a couple of things in this video. Uh, number one, we're going to show how uh, the results from the previous video in terms of the winners and losers from the practice of production can be extended when we allow for international trade. Actually, that's quite a um, almost a trivial exercise because we're we're going to show that essentially the introduction of trade just changes the relative prices. And in the previous uh, video, we changed the relative prices. We just didn't give a reason for it. We said, oh, I assume that the relative price changes, that kind of thing. Um, and left it at that and showed the winners and losers. Now we're just going to say, well, because of trade, the relative prices change, and that's what's going to cause that the winners and losers. So in, in some respects, we can do that relatively quickly. And then what we're going to do is we're going to sort of use that, use this result to look at how uh, the inclusion of trade will um, improve our consumption choices, our consumption possibilities. We're going to sort of separate a little bit out the difference between production of the good and the consumption of the good. And obviously with trade, the two don't have to be equal anymore. So that's, uh, and then we're going to look at sort of, we're going to ask the question about, you know, gains and whether we gain overall, etc. Okay. So as I said before, um, or as we saw in the previous uh, video, that uh, when you change the uh, relative prices, um, one sector or the owners of the um, specific factor in one sector is going to be better off and, those, and the specific factor in the other is going to be worse off. So what we're going to show here is that in the exporting goods sector, um, the owners of that factor of production, the specific factor of production, are going to benefit and will hurt the importing, the owner of the specific factor of production in the import competing sector. The effect on the mobile sector, that labour, remember, that could move between the sectors is still ambiguous. So remember, that's, I'll show you that result in a sec, but again, it's, it's actually quite trivial in the sense that it's just changing the relative prices. Then, as I said, we're going to look at how, in aggregate, we can gain from trade. And just say a couple of little things about it and then we're going to actually use that issue um, a bit later on we're going to look at we're going to spend a bit of time in subsequent videos looking at winners and losers so let's have a look at this initial result first and then we'll take it from there okay so the first step in looking at this is we're going to go back to sort of a relative demand relative supply model initially with the closed economy so again we're just looking at the um, at this individual country no trade at the moment uh, now, uh, we've got on the vertical axis, we've got the relative price of cloth on the horizontal, we've got the relative quantity. The relative bit is obviously really important here, as we've discussed in previous videos. We're not looking at the aggregate, we're looking at that ratio, if you like, the relative prices and quantities. So here you can see with the closed economy, we've got a relative supply curve that's upward sloping. Um, that's pretty obvious as the relative price of cloth increases. Um, the owners uh, or the producers of cloth are more willing to supply more cloth, so it's going to be upward sloping. The relative demand curve is uh, downward sloping, and again, just simply reflects that uh, as the price of cloth goes down, consumers are willing to, to demand or buy more cloth. So that's, a, that's fairly intuitive in that sense. In a closed economy, we're going to get that relative price and we're going to get that relative quantity. So that's fine. What we want to do now is we want to look at what happens when we introduce world demand and supply. So open the economy up. Now, a few things are of note here, first of all. The first is, um, you know, why have I put this relative world supply curve here, sort of up to the left? Remember, this is relative. It's not an absolute. We're not saying that you open up and, and the supply of this, of, of cloth decreases, for example. That's a relative. So um, what I've got here, I've got the relative supply being, if you like, above, to the left, whatever, of the domestic relative supply curve, could be the other way, okay? And this is just an example I'm using. So the relative supply curve could, of course, be on the other side of this, could be located sort of there. Moreover, the differences can be explained through uh, simple differences in the technology, um, the production, or even resource differences. This issue of resource differences and actually technology we're going to address in later videos in a different different topic. At the moment we can just sort of wave our hands around and say that um, that explains the differences in the relative supply of this good. Now of course as soon as you open up the market 
uh, to the world, then you're going to um, change the relative prices. So in other words, we're going to get a new uh, relative price of this good. When you open it up, the domestic uh, producers are going to um, and, and consumers are going to have to sort of accept, if you like, this relative price change. A quick note on the relative demand here, you'll notice that that didn't shift. So relative to the previous closed economy one, uh, we've just put the relative demand curve in the same spot. It's an assumption that we make, but it does make the analysis quite a bit easier. And that's just to say, if you assume the same preferences, then the relative demand curve won't change. Remember, this is relative and not absolute. So if they've got the same preferences, it means that they've got the same relative demand as the change in, uh, as the change in relative prices, say decreases or increases, it's got the same effect. So it's a, it's a pretty big assumption, but it's, it makes our job a lot easier here. So notice here that the relative price of cloth now has risen. Okay? Uh, just, a, uh, just a quick reiteration of this. Yes, it's shifted to the left, or it's the, the relative quantity of cloth has declined. But just remember, sort of in the, you can't show it explicitly on this diagram, but just implicitly, just remember that that doesn't mean that the country that's exporting this, that is um, uh, exporting the cloth, is decreasing their production of cloth. Right? It's the relative quantities that's uh, important here. So the individual, in absolute terms, the individual country can increase their quantity of cloth that they produce and export some of it. Okay, It's just that it's not reflected here in the relative global uh, world demand and supply. So that's one thing. So again, sorry, just before I keep going on that one, just uh, to reiterate that the rest of the results flow from that, from the previous video. So again, um, if you go back to that video and you'll see what, remember what happened when you changed the relative price. And in the previous example, this is kind of why I've put this relative supply uh, curve sort of to the left that results in the higher um, a relative price of cloth. That's the example I used in the previous video where the relative price of cloth rose and you got all those results that, that flowed from that, the benefits to the owners of the capital who are in the cloth industry and the negative effects on the uh, landowners uh, associated with uh, food production. So that, that bit doesn't change. All we're doing here is giving an explanation for the change in that relative price. Okay. What we now want to turn to is this uh, important issue of now separating, if you like, to some extent, the difference between consumption and production. Now, uh, obviously in a closed economy, two must equal. Whatever you produce must will be consumed. And you can't consume more than you produce in a closed economy by definition. But of course in an open model, in an open uh, model economy, the two can and will be different. Uh, to make things a bit easier, uh, we've assumed here there's no international borrowing or lending. The reason for that, I'll get to the reason for that in a sec, but um, what that will do is, uh, as, you're gonna, as we're gonna see, is that we're still constrained in the amount that we can consume. And I'll show you how, how we are constrained in that sense in a minute. But if you've got, obviously, international borrowing, then that gives you more money to be able to spend on, say, imports. And that link that we're going to establish kind of breaks down. Um, in the textbook, uh, they do go through this, where they relax this assumption and allow international borrowing. We're actually not going to do it in this course. Um, but if you super enthusiastic and um, dedicated you can have a look at it but we're, we're not really going to be looking at it uh, here okay so because of this we get this we can um, have this expression here and on the left hand side this new notation which I probably should explain this is just consumption I don't want to use the term C because we're using it for cloth so D means consumption and so DC is the consumption of cloth DF the consumption of food now obviously this the price multiplied by your consumption of cloth and the price multiplied by your consumption of food is going to equal the total value of consumption. So that's on the left hand side. On the right hand side, this is Q is production. So this is what we're actually making, not necessarily consuming, but producing. So on the right hand side, we've got the value of production. Now what we can do is we can rearrange this and we can get this expression here. Now on the left hand side, what we're doing here, you can see this is the uh, value of the imports. So if assuming that, that you know the consumption is greater than the production, 
by definition that means we must be importing it. Uh, on the other side of the thing we've got here the cloth exports so the, con um, the production is greater than the consumption and what's left over that difference we're exporting and then we've got the relative prices here as well so what we're saying here is that what you earn in terms of exports what you earn that whole thing in terms of exports you can then turn around and spend on your imports and that's the that's the constraint okay and that's why we've got that assumption here of no uh, borrowing a lending because th this will no longer hold okay so let's bring this into a sort of a production slash consumption possibility situation so remember you can uh, an, an economy can import an amount of food that is equal to the relative price of cloth times the amount of cloth export that's from the previous um, slide in other words, what you import is limited by your exports. That's that constraint again, that um, sure you can expand your consumption possibilities, but that, that is limited, that is constrained. So actually what we, we can construct here, if you like, is our budget constraint. Now what we mean by that is, and I'll, yeah, there we go, I'll put the actual budget constraint there. I know I've run out of room and I know that budget constraint's going up and up and up, but it doesn't matter. The reason why we call this the budget constraint is simply that reflection that we're limited by how many imports we can buy because of how much money we're earning from exports. Right? So this is simply saying consuming one less unit of cloth is going to save the economy PC. In other words, we're not going to be spending that dollar amount on cloth or you know, a unit of cloth. That money that we're not spending on cloth, that unit of cloth, we can use to buy that many units of food yeah so that's the constraint here we can't do more than that you can't take the money that you save on um, buying uh, or spending um, uh, that amount of money less on a unit of cloth and then do more than that here so you can't that's why this is that this is the budget constraint you can't basically go beyond I shouldn't have drawn that in there. You can't go past your budget constraint. So bear that in mind. Now, I picked this point here, um, uh, not arbitrary, well, sort of arbitrarily, actually. Um, this is simply um, saying, oh, well, maybe um, this is what we, this is the constraint that would have occurred pre trade. So remember, when you've got um, no trade, your production possibility frontier is also your consumption possibility frontier. So that's really the point of that, that dot there is to say, well, in a closed economy, that's your limit. And I'm not going to put dotted lines here, um, as you'll see why in a sec, but um, you're constrained by that amount. When you open it up in terms of trade, but we can spend any amount sort of here. There we go. In other words, This here, I've got the arrow, I'll put it in here. Anywhere in here is possible. Yeah, which is greater obviously than this initial amount. In other words, relative to the closed economy, we can now improve, we can buy more of both if we want, more food, more cloth. We can buy simply more um, food if we go up in this, straight up in this direction, up to there. But that's the most that we can do. We can't afford, based on our exports of, say, cloth, we can't afford any more than that. So we can't be at a point like that. But we can be on there. So the gains from trade above and beyond what we um, could do before is bounded, if you like, by this area here. Now, that dot could be anywhere. In other words, we could be, we could have had in a closed economy. Oh, don't, this is terrible drawing, sorry. We could have been at a point there. Same principle would have occurred we would have had there and we could have been able to expand our consumption possibilities in this direction all there all there etc okay uh, the point about this is simply that um, that there's that at that point there's no um, it's simply a reflection that um, a country can always um, consume what it produces so in that at that point there of course remember the two are the same and that's always going to be the case for saying, yeah, that's fine. Um, you, any, any country can always consume everything that it produces. Yeah. 
and so the consumption possibilities is, is the same as the cons uh, production possibilities there that's all so again just highlighting this the gains from trade is that the economy is now able to afford amounts of cloth and food that it could not previously um, do because it couldn't produce it itself doesn't have the resources to be able to produce it itself but by uh, earning exports or um, uh, selling exports if you like it can now uh, get imports and it can expand its consumption possibilities now we know from this that in aggregate this means that the economy is going to be better off is everyone going to be better off well not necessarily and this is one of the issues here the point though is and and I guess this is this funny little area here here yeah. the, the one of the funny points that this is sort of demonstrating is that um, the winners gain more than the losers so even if not everyone is better off as a result of this you can see that that because our consumption possibilities have, imp have increased and we can we can consume more of both it means that we can um, the, the gains or losers can be co compensated and we can still in aggregate be better off now this is a fairly limited way of showing that and we're actually going to show that in um, more detail uh, subsequent to this in subsequent videos but that's that's a sort of a first pass through if you like of looking at this issue and then in subsequent videos we're going to look more specifically at the winners and losers in particular what we're going to do uh, in the next video is we're going to use a lot of the results from this or some of the results anyway or some of the methodology uh, from this model where they're going to change some of the assumptions a little bit we're going to look at um, uh, what we call the heckscher olin model which basically um, very simple terms here in this model we had the specific factors capital and, and land and they couldn't move you know they were specific to the good being produced in the heckscher olin model we can relax that assumption a bit okay